Hi everyone, uh, today we're going to be spending some time covering examples. This uh, video is meant to give you some extra practice uh, problems that you might see and some solutions to how to work them out in the topic of one-dimensional and two-dimensional kinematics. Uh, I have crafted a few different examples uh, ranging from sort of 1D uh, motion focusing on calculus up through projectile motion. So let's uh, get going as we head on through. Uh, the first example I'd like to present is a case from astrophysics. Uh, they, when a star dies, a massive star dies at the end of its life, it uh, explodes in a supernova explosion. And this explosion is huge, massive, puts out tons of energy, something like 10 to the 44 joules worth of energy, into the interstellar medium. So that's the gas inside the galaxy, and it blasts a shock wave outward. Uh, this is actually a picture of the Cassiopeia A supernova remnant, and it's expanding outward into space in a spherical shock front. And some astrophysics that you get to cover later on in your degree will actually derive an expression for how quickly that shock front will move out. But uh, stating without proof, it has a uh, radius that expands uh, as a times t to the two fifths. So a is some number, and then t is time raised to the two fifths power. And the uh, physics 144 problem we'd like to address is uh, how to find the velocity and the acceleration of this shock front. So without further ado, uh, we're going to take our expression here for r of t. Uh, so r of t is equal to a t to the two fifths. So that's the radius, so how fast it's moving outward. And then the velocity of that shock front as it's moving radially outward is the time derivative of the radius. So that's correspondingly a one-dimensional variable. It just happens to be the radius uh, of this front as it moves outward. And from calculus, we're going to say that we want to take the time derivative d by dt of this expression, a t to the two fifths. Now, a is a constant, so the derivative uh, doesn't affect that. The constant comes out in front, so a. And then we take the time derivative, d by dt, of t to the two fifths. And that two fifths is in this power, uh, so we know that the time derivative of a uh, expression of t to the n is going to give us an expression n times t to the n minus 1. In this case, n equals 2 fifths. So we're going to take the 2 fifths down, and that appears right here in front. So this expression becomes 2 fifths times a times t, and then we're going to take that 2 fifths and subtract 1 from it. So 2 fifths minus 5 fifths, or another way of saying 1, is going to be equal to negative 3 fifths. And we're done. This is part a. So the velocity of the shock front is 2 fifths a t to the minus 3 fifths. We can figure out the acceleration of that shock front as the time derivative d by dt of the velocity, which is equal to d by dt of uh, 2 fifths times a t to the negative 3 fifths. And then 2 fifths and a are constants, so the derivative passes inside them. So we get 2 fifths a d by dt t to the minus 3 fifths. And again, we're going to use this relationship up here that says that we just take to take the derivative of a power, we subtract one from the power, or we bring down whatever the power is uh, into the constant in front, and then uh, take one away from the power. So here, the power is negative three fifths. So this is going to be equal to two fifths a. The negative three fifths comes down, negative three fifths, and joins in the constant, and then the derivative, we subtract 1 from the power, so negative 3 fifths minus 5 fifths will be t to the negative 8 fifths. And if we uh, sort of recenter here, then we're going to combine uh, this constant, so we'll multiply 2 times 3 is negative, uh, so there'll be a negative sign, there'll be 2 times 3 is negative 6, and then the denominator is 5 times 5, 20 fifths, times that unknown constant a, t to the minus 8 fifths. 
So we're done. We figured out the acceleration. And in terms of our uh, example, uh, part one is done. So we figured out the velocity and the acceleration, but we have this unknown constant a sitting in the expression. So what we need to do next is figure out what a is, and we have to be given an expression, and that is the actual values here. Oops, let's, let's use the highlighter. Uh, so we know how fast the shock front is moving, a mere 5,000 kilometers per second, because you know space is big and fast, and then uh, the time is a mere 300 years. So we can use our expression here for the velocity that's given here uh, to figure out what a is. So we know v of t is equal to 2 fifths a t to the minus 3 fifths, and from there, what we'll do is we'll uh, solve this expression for a. So this becomes 5 halves, because 2 fifths uh, time, um, oops, sorry, let me be a little clearer. So 5 halves times v of t divided by t to the negative 3 fifths is equal to a. So that's solving this expression here for a. So now a is on one side by itself. Notice 1 over t to the negative 3 fifths becomes t to the positive 3 fifths. So this expression can be written as a is equal to 5 halves v of t times t to the 3 fifths. And then we substitute in the values that are given in the problem. So this becomes 5 halves. The speed here is 5,000 kilometers per second, and I'm going to work in uh, SI units, so I need to convert that kilometers into meters. So we get 10 to the 3 meters is equal to 1 kilometer, so I multiply by that conversion factor, and then I'm going to multiply by 300 years raised to the 3 fifths power. 300 years and a year is not a, a meter, kilogram, or a second, so we have to convert that. Uh, as an astronomer, I have uh, one of the facts at my fingertips is that one year, one year, is very closely 3.16 times 10 to the 7 seconds, so, or 31.6 million seconds. Uh, I also like to remember that pi seconds is about a nanocentury. Uh, so that's a number that will uh, that I find very useful. And we raise that to three-fifths. Uh, so in terms of constants, the kilometers cancel out, the years cancel out, and then we end up with an expression that looks like this. So we get a number, and that number, thanks to the power of a calculator, is 1.21 times 10 to the 13th. And its units here are meters... And then we have a seconds to the three-fifths divided by a second. So this is going to be uh, a meter over a second to the two-fifths. And if you return to your original expression, something that said that r of t was equal to a t to the two-fifths, you notice if I plug in a value of seconds for that t, I'll get seconds to the two-fifths and then that will be in the numerator, and then this seconds to the two-fifths in the denominator will cancel with it, leaving me with an answer in meters. So the constants have to have this um, kind of weird set of units so that they'll cancel out and give me a good final answer for the radius. All right, that's the end of that example. In the next example, I want to talk about uh, a porcupine. Here we have a case where an acceleration of a porcupine um, is going to be, oh, there we are. An acceleration of a porcupine is given by some functional form, a uh, of ax, so acceleration in the x direction as a function of t, is at minus bt squared. And we have some constant values here for a and for b. Uh, notice that they're set up with these weird units so that when I cancel them, uh, when I plug them in and I put in time in seconds, I'll get meters per second squared. That's the units of acceleration. So, you know, that meters per second cubed 
times a second will leave me with a meter per second squared, and then meters per second to the fourth for this constant uh, times a second squared will again leave me with meters per second squared. So the units are looking great. And we have that the porcupine is at rest when at x equals zero, when t equals zero. And now I find the velocity of the porcupine and the position of the porcupine as functions of time. So here we're going opposite direction from what we did in the previous example and computing the uh, velocity given the acceleration. All right, uh, to do that, I want to, I'll just start working this one here, which is to say that I'm going to use the expression that the acceleration as a function and the x direction as a function of t is equal to dv by dt. That's the velocity divided, uh, the derivative of velocity with respect to time. And now uh, we'll sort of separate this variable by multiplying both sides by dt. Uh, mathematicians hate it when you do this one simple trick that doesn't work in weird vector spaces, but that's okay. Uh, so dv is equal to a, I'm just going to drop the x and the t for notational compactness right now. So it's a dt. And then what I need to do is I'm going to integrate that expression. And I need to integrate between corresponding uh, bounds. So I'm going to say I'm going to start at some velocity v0, and I'm going to go to some velocity v, uh, which is the final velocity. And to keep track of which v is the bound of the velocity and which v is the uh, thing in the integral, I like to put a little prime on the thing that I'm integrated. It becomes what we call a dummy variable of integration. So we just kind of keeping track of which thing we're integrating and which thing is the bound. Uh, similarly, we're going to start uh, an integration in time so that we go from zero to some time t. And again, I'm going to put a little prime on my dummy variable there uh, because I'm going to integrate over it and substitute in. So notice that the bounds correspond to each other here. So the v0 is the speed when time equals zero. And the v is the final speed when the time is equal to t. You may know where we're going because if we go back here, you know that is at rest when time equals zero. So that's going to tell us that that v naught is zero. But I'm going to include it just for, you know, complete uh, completeness. And then we integrate. So if we have uh, this first expression is a constant. It is one uh, times dv. Uh, so we integrate dv. The constant one, when I integrate it, I just get the variable uh, v. And so that gives me the variable v prime, and I'm going to evaluate it between the bounds of v0 and v. So that's kind of a weird way of writing it, but I'm just kind of putting all of the steps in here and using all of the notation. Similarly, I'm going to integrate the expression for uh, acceleration, and uh, that has to be the integral of, from 0 to t, of a t prime minus b t prime squared dt prime. Uh, so we've substituted that in. And then I can carry out that integral. Uh, so these are constants uh, a times uh, powers. So this first one is t prime to the first. So when I integrate that, I get a t prime squared over 2. And you'll notice when I take a derivative of that expression, that 2 will come down and cancel with the 2 in the denominator, subtract 1 from the index, and we get back to the a t prime. So everything's looking good there. And then we're going to integrate the t squared, and that gives me b t prime cubed over 3. And I want to evaluate that from 0 to t. And now I'm going to plug in my bounds. And the way these bounds symbols work is I take uh, the thing at the top and I substitute it in. So that's v. And I subtract off the thing in the bottom bound, minus v naught. So I evaluate this function here at the two bounds and compute the difference between them. Similarly, we're going to do the same thing over here with the time integral. And when we do that, we will plug in the uh, value for t. So we get a t squared over 2 minus b t cubed over 3 minus a t 
prime squared over 2 evaluated for t equals 0, but that's just 0, and then minus a negative uh, plug in 0 to this second expression, and we get another 0. So we just get, and then we're going to finally assert that the v0 it goes to 0 uh, because of the condition that this is at rest. Okay. That seems like a lot that I've kind of put here in one place, uh, but what we're largely setting up here is all of the formalism in case we don't start at t equals zero. What if it has an initial velocity? The same method would work, but we would just have to keep track of our bounds of the integration a little bit better. So we've kind of come down to a concluding uh, result that the time function of the porcupine here is a, t squared over 2 minus b t cubed over 3. Okay, a lot of details, uh, but we can actually take a look at what this graph looks like. I've graphed the expression for the acceleration here. So it starts out at the zero acceleration. It rises up to some max acceleration, looks like we're around 6.5, a little less than that, and then comes down here and at about 12 and a half, ends up uh, crossing uh, back to negative acceleration at that point. Then I can take this velocity curve and see if this makes sense. So I'm going to graph that, and that's shown here. And what we see um, is that as the uh, system is accelerating, the velocity curve gets steeper and steeper and steeper up to a point where uh, we sort of cross this uh, six and a half uh, ish time here, and then you'll notice that the velocity curve doesn't accelerate, uh, doesn't get steeper as much anymore. It just kind of continues up, and right here at the point when t equals about twelve and a half, that's here, we reach a maximum of velocity. So we're increasing the velocity everywhere that this curve is above zero, so it has positive acceleration. And then when it turns around and the curve is less than zero, we see that the velocity curve starts to drop off and starts to decrease. So those are two corresponding components. So we just plotted that velocity function uh, at, and as a function of time, and we get something that kind of agrees with, uh, these two graphs kind of agree and make sense with each other. So the last thing we need to do is figure out the position of the porcupine as a function of time. And to do that, we're going to uh, carry out another integral. And again, I'm going to kind of belabor the point and kind of go through a lot of details. On test and exam, you don't have to put in as much detail. I just want to show you where all of these parts are coming from. So to remind uh, you, the uh, velocity is the time derivative of the position. And so if I rearrange that to say that dx is equal to v times dt, and I'm going to integrate that uh, from some initial position to the final position, and again, I'll use a dummy variable, x prime, and I'm going to integrate from 0 to t with some dummy variable t. So this is simply saying at time equals 0, it's at position x0, and at time equals t, it's at position x, and then we've stuffed in these uh, primes in the time and the position that we're integrating over just to keep them separate from the bounds that I'm putting into the uh, problem. Okay, so now let's uh, fill out in more detail. I'm going to just give myself a little more room here. And I'm going to say that this first integral here is going to, again, integrate the constant 1. And when I do that, I just get the variable x. And so we get x prime evaluated between x naught and x. And then my time variable, I'm going to substitute in my expression for the velocity uh, that I figured out last time. And so that's equal to a t squared over 2 minus b t cubed over 3 dt, and these are primed variables, so I'm going to put in the primes on the t's there. That just keeps track of which thing we're integrating over. Okay, we can then carry out that integral uh, as the second step, so we'll start out with this first term here. That's t squared. Uh, when I integrate that, I'll get t cubed, but uh, because when I've 
pull uh, what well, I have a power of three. When I take the derivative of that, three has to cancel with something. So I put the three in the denominator and I'll end up with an expression that this is a over two times t prime cubed over three. And you notice when I take the time derivative of that, that three will come down and cancel. I'll get back to my original expression. Good. So then uh, minus b t prime to the fourth over three times four. I just did that all in one step here. So I knew it was t to the fourth and then I have to divide by four uh, in the denominator to cancel out. And I'm going to evaluate that expression from zero to t. Okay, uh, let's actually plug in some bounds now. So first off, we'll start with the left-hand side of this expression, which is x prime uh, evaluated from x uh, between x naught and x. So we plug in the first uh, variable, uh, which is x, and we subtract off the initial variable, that's x naught. Uh, so that gives us our left-hand side. And then our right-hand side, we plug in the variable for t. Uh, so this becomes a t cubed. And then down here, I'm going to multiply those 2 times 3, and that'll give me the 6. Then I'm going to do the plug in the t uh, for the second variable, and then multiply the 3 times 4 together. So I get minus b t to the fourth over 12. And then again, to be completely thorough, I have to plug in the zero for the first term. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, but that's uh, going to just cancel out. So that give me a zero. Uh, and then we plug in a zero for the second term. And again, that's also zero. And I was, you know, a minus a negative is a positive, but it's a zero. So it doesn't really matter. Okay. So that gives me my final expression, a t cubed over six minus b t to the fourth over 12, all done. Final piece of information is we go back to the original problem and we see that at t equals zero, x is equal to zero. So that means that that x naught term that I was worried about here, this is by the conditions given in the problem, that's going to go to zero. So we end up with a final expression that x of t is equal to a t cubed over 6 minus b t to the fourth over 12. All right, that concludes this kinematics problem where we have a case where we have a friend in a hot air balloon that is four meters off the ground. Here's a hot air balloon. It is starting a distance of four meters off the ground. It's not accelerating upward. It is rising upward at a constant speed. We'll call it V0B of uh, two meters per second. And there, your friend has forgotten their lunch. So you, being a, a real pal, throw the sandwich upward uh, to them at a speed of V0S, which is equal to 13 meters per second. You are quite the sandwich thrower, it turns out. And we want to know what are two possible times at which the sandwich can be caught from, by your friend, assuming you're right underneath it. Uh, we're going to define the plus y direction to be upward, and we're going to treat this as a one-dimensional problem. Sandwich flying upward to hit balloon and get caught by your friend. And in both of these cases, we are treating the, uh, the, the problem in terms of a one-dimensional uh, problem with the basic constant acceleration uh, uh, parameters. And here we can write down the position for your friend. We'll say your friend is equal to the initial position for your friend. Oh, I've called it balloon. Let me call it balloon again. You know, why balloon? is the initial position for the balloon plus the initial speed for the balloon plus one half times the acceleration of the balloon t squared. More on that. And then I will note that we have a constant speed rising upward of two meters per second. So that means that the acceleration is zero. And so that's our complete expression where y not of the balloon is 4.0 meters and we have v naught for the balloon is equal to 2.0 meters per second. Now I should note uh, at this point that I'm using a lot of these subscripts here uh, 
And the subscripts are just ways of giving variables different names. Things in the exponents, like that squared there, those are mathematically important. Anything that's in a subscript down here, I don't care about. It's just a way of giving a variable a different name. So don't worry about the mathematics of it later until like, I don't know, third year electricity and magnetism when suddenly math appears in the subscript position. It's, it'll be worth it, trust me. Um, okay, so returning to uh, the problem at hand, this was the expression for the balloon. Then we can write down a similar expression for the sandwich. So y naught sandwich plus v naught sandwich uh, times t minus one half g t squared. And I've adopted this form because as soon as the sandwich leaves your hand, it is subject to the whimsy of gravity and gravity in a free fall problem starts to pull things down with an acceleration of g downward uh, here. And I've ascribed a minus sign here to the acceleration term because I have already defined my plus y direction going upward. So that means uh, I can look through all this. I am going to set the y not sandwich to be zero because you are throwing the sandwich from ground level upward. But I do know that the initial speed for that sandwich, v not sandwich, is 13 meters per second. And then g is g. And so the criterion for your friend catching the sandwich is that the balloon is at the same height as the sandwich. So we just equate these two expressions. We say y naught balloon plus v naught balloon t is equal to uh, v naught sandwich t minus one half g t squared. And here it's all over but the algebra. We've done, we've done the physics. Now we have to solve for t. So I'm going to collect all terms on one side of the equation. So it has a zero on the other side of the equation. So this becomes one half g t squared uh, plus, oops, let's make that into an actual plus sign, v naught b minus v naught s times t, uh, okay, okay, uh, plus y naught b is equal to zero. So I've pulled everything to the left-hand side of the equation here. Uh, changing signs as appropriate. And now this is a quadratic. So we can apply the quadratic formula, which is negative b, so that's going to be v naught sandwich minus v naught balloon, plus or minus the square root of b squared, which is v naught balloon minus v naught sandwich squared, minus four times a, which is g over two, times c, which is y naught of the balloon, all, oops, all over 2a, where a is a half g, so that's just going to be over g. So let's plug in some numbers. The speed of the sandwich is 13, the speed of the balloon is 2, so this is 11 meters per second, plus or minus the square root of uh, negative 11 meters per second squared minus 4 times 5 meters per second squared times the initial height of the balloon, which is 4 meters. Uh, and then we're all going to divide by uh, g, which is just 10 meters per second squared. I'm going to sneak up here in my algebra, try not to go to another page here. So this is uh, in uh, meters per second over meters per second squared leaves with me with units of seconds. And so we have t is equal to 11 plus or minus the square root of 121 minus 4 times 5 is 20 times 4 is 80 all over 10. Uh, which is uh, square root of four, 11 plus or minus square root of 41 over 10 seconds. This is also seconds. And so in terms of uh, actual calculations, we can pop that out as 1.74 seconds and 0 0.45 seconds. So we have two roots to the equation. 
Both of them make sense. They're both positive numbers. They happen after you throw. And so this corresponds to uh, two scenarios. Your friend either is going to catch the sandwich uh, here. So the either you're going to take the sandwich. Your friend is moving upward here. And the sandwich is going to get caught by your friend as it's going up or the sandwich is going to go up cross its apex uh, and start falling back down and your friend is going to rise up and uh, catch it there going the opposite direction so those are what the two roots of this expression correspond to and therefore give you your two values of 1.74 and 0 0.75 0 0.45 seconds Whew. Okay. Uh, this is just uh, starting out uh, to say, uh, well, if I have a particle here with a uh, position that's given by this formula, it's a t squared in the i hat direction plus b t minus c t squared in the j hat direction, I'd like to know what the particle's velocity, speed, and acceleration are. And so if I have this kind of problem, I need to calculate uh, the velocity is, the velocity vector is the time derivative of this. And this is just screaming for just doing a little calculus because I have an explicit functional form for what the trajectory is as a function of time. Uh, I have individual x and y components. And so I can calculate that as dr, uh, we'll call that dx by dt i hat plus dy by dt j hat. And so sticking that in the expressions, d, that's d by dt. So we take the time derivative of at squared times the i hat vector, and we take the time derivative of the uh, bt minus ct squared j hat, uh, that's the y component of the vector. So now we take the derivative. This is a constant multiplied by t squared in the first term uh, right here. And so I am going to write that. Uh, that's the t squared. The 2 comes down, leaving a 1 in the exponent. And then the 2 gets multiplied up front. So this becomes 2 a t i hat. Okay, that's all good. And then I take the time derivative of, of the second term over here. Uh, the time derivative of b times t. b is a constant, so t is t to the first. That becomes down, comes t to the zero, or the t disappears. And the power comes down as one, so that just becomes a b. And then I do the derivative over here to get minus 2ct j hat. So that's the velocity vector check. All good. Now I need to know the speed. The speed is the magnitude of the velocity vector or the square root of v dot v or vx squared plus vy squared. That's a little messy. Let's make that plus vy squared. Uh, there'd be a vz term if I gave you a third dimension. And so I can just plug that in. This is vx. And this other term is vy, and so the uh, this becomes 4a squared t squared. I took the 2at and I squared everything, and then I have b minus 2ct quantity squared all to the square root. So I could go ahead and simplify this a little bit, but I'm going to leave it the way it is uh, for right now uh, for reasons that will become clear soon. Okay. The next thing I need to do is to calculate the acceleration. So the acceleration is dv by dt, and I've got an expression for v right here. So I take the time derivative of the individual terms here. So we'll start out with the 2at term. That is just t to the first power. The other two things are constants. So the acceleration there is just going to be 2a i hat. And then the second uh, uh, term, 
the uh, first part of it, I'm going to take the time derivative of a constant b. That's nothing. It's constant. d by dt of a constant is zero, so it drops out. And then this just uh, takes away the uh, power of t. t to the first becomes t to the zero, leaving me with a minus 2c j hat. So that's the acceleration for the particle. So we're doing well. We got everything that we uh, need here. Uh, okay. So that uh, that would be how I'd calculate these things, but wait, there's more. And so I actually want to go ahead and lasso some of my math here. Whoop! Because I'm going to need that for later. Copy. Because if I flip to the next page, I have at what time is the velocity perpendicular to the acceleration? And at what time is the particle's uh, speed instantaneously not changing? So I'm going to pop my math back in here because I need it for later. Nope, I've got a little extra math in here. Let's get rid of that. Goodbye. And so this was my velocity vector. This was my speed. Uh, so velocity vector, speed, and acceleration. So if I'm going to answer a question, at what time is the particle's velocity perpendicular to its acceleration? Well, that's basically asking for when the angle between those two is 90 degrees. We don't have an automatic way of doing that, except we did learn about the dot product last time. And we learned that if two vectors are perpendicular, their dot product is zero. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set A dotted with V equal to zero. And so then I get, I'm going to carry out the dot product of, of this vector with this vector, which means just multiply together the two x components. So that's going to be, well, I'll write it out. Let's do 2at i hat plus b minus 2ct j hat. That's, oh, that's the velocity vector. So this is v. And fortunately, the dot product commutes. So 2a i hat minus 2c j hat. And then let me uh, maybe a little clearer and change color to say this part up here is the velocity vector. This part down here is the acceleration vector. And so I carry out the dot product by multiplying together the two uh, terms. So this is 2a times 2at. Uh, so that gives us 4a squared t. Uh, and i dot i goes to 1. And then I add the product of uh, vy times ay, which is b minus 2ct times minus 2c. And so I get 4a squared t uh, I'm going to bring up the second term here, which is negative 2c minus 2c, which is plus 4c squared t. And then I have a minus 2cb. And I want to know where those are 0. And so I'm going to solve this for t. And so then t is going to be 2cb over 4a squared plus 4c squared. There's a 2 in every term. So I'm going to just write this as 2cb over 2 a squared plus 2c squared. Okay, so that finds me a time when the velocity is perpendicular to its acceleration. That's pretty cool. Okay. Okay, our next step here is to calculate what the uh, times when the particle's speed is instantaneously not changing. And so that means that we need to find a case where the speed of the particle is not getting larger or smaller. And since the we represent changes uh, in time in uh, physics and calculus by asking, where is that? Uh, quantities time derivative equal to zero. So if I ever see an instantaneously not zero, not changing, that means that the time derivative of whatever quantity that is, is zero at that given point. So I need to actually calculate where, oh, this is going to be tricky, d 
v by dt is. And we have an expression for the speed, which is right there. So I need to actually take the time derivative of this. And this is something that's a little tricky um, because it involves that chain rule that I was talking about. It's a whole bunch of stuff raised to the one half power. And so the way we take that uh, time derivative is we first take the time derivative of something to the one half power. Let's uh, say, and when I do that, I have the one half power and that power comes down. So I get one half, then I get whatever it is raised to the one half minus one or negative one half power. So then I just write down 4at squared plus b minus 2ct squared to the minus 1 half power. And then I have to take the time derivative of whatever is inside it. And so then that gives me something I'm, oh, I'm totally comfortable with these polynomials. Uh, so 4at squared, the time derivative of that is 8 a squared t and then the time derivative of the second term oh it's a mess it's one of those things where it's something squared so i got a chain rule again so i take the time derivative of the mess uh, which brings down the two i write out whatever is left to the one power so it's to the first power because the two came down leaving behind one and then i take the time derivative of whatever is inside the b, that term there, goes away. Time derivative of a constant is zero. Uh, and then we take the time derivative of b uh, minus 2ct, uh, which just leaves us behind a minus 2c. OK, so that's how we take the time derivative of a big compound expression uh, raised to the 1 half power. I want to find out where this is equal to 0. I'm going to institute a handy little border between my mathematics here. There we are. OK. And uh, the way we're going to do that is by looking at and basically say this is 1 half times a bunch of junk that's the square root of something in the denominator. Uh, and then there's a numerator, which is this term. And I'm going to invoke some mathematics, which is the only way that a fraction is going to be zero is if its numerator is zero. Uh, and so all I actually care about is I don't have to worry about this term or this term. I'm going to cross multiply them up, feed them into the zero, nom 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 nom, and it's going to give me uh, a resulting expression that is just a a squared t plus I'm going to do some multiplying out. I'm going to bring in this uh, two, negative 2c here. I'm going to multiply it by the 2 and the b, and that's going to give me oops uh, minus 4bc. Uh, and then I have another term here, which is the 2 times negative 2ct times another negative 2c. And so that leaves me with plus 8 a, uh, sorry, not a, I'm looking at the wrong part of the formula, um, c squared, t squared. And those negatives went away because I multiplied by two negatives. And that whole mess is equal to zero. So again, I can solve that and I find, uh, oops, this should also be a t squared. No, it should be a t. This is a t here. It's gone. Okay. Uh, so that's all good. And so now I can solve for the t. I'm going to 8a squared plus 8c squared times t. I'll push the minus 4bc to the other side. Uh, then I'll divide. And so I'll get 4bc over 8a squared plus 8c squared. c squared. Uh, times t. And I have a 4 in all the terms, so I'm left with bc plus 2a squared plus 2c squared. Wait, I've seen this math before. It's right here. These are the same terms. These are the same thing. Ooh, it's kind of cool. And that 
is generically true. Basically what's happening here is I have a particle, it's moving along a trajectory, has some velocity, call that the velocity vector, and it has some acceleration. And if those are perpendicular to each other, the acceleration is going to curve the uh, velocity vector, change its direction, but it's not gonna change its magnitude. But if my if I'm later on in my trajectory and I have a particle moving along here and it's up here and I have a velocity vector that's again always tangent to my trajectory and my acceleration vector is doing something else. It is not perpendicular to the velocity. So this would be perpendicular in my bad drawing. Uh, you have a component that's doing the change of direction. That's the perpendicular component. And you also have a component that goes ahead and is making the magnitude of the velocity vector get larger or smaller. So there is some component going in here that changes direction. So this is changing direction. And then this other component here is going to change speed. And so the acceleration vector can do both, but its orientation relative to the velocity vector actually tells you whether it's increasing or decreasing speed or changing the direction of the particle or both. Okay. All right. Um, I think we're going to do one final example on this kind of topic. Uh, which is to kind of go the opposite. Remember with kinematics, we could go from positions all the way to accelerations by taking derivatives. We can also go from uh, accelerations back to positions by taking integrals. So let's go ahead and illustrate that. Uh, this is a case where we have a particle originally at rest and it's located at some position, three, three i hat plus two j hat plus five k hat in uh, the meters. It's subject to an acceleration that's given by this functional form. And I want to know where I have some constants here. I want to know the particle's position at t equals two seconds. So uh, to the integral forms look just like the one dimensional cases, except we put vectors on top of them. And so one of the expressions that I have is I'm going to start with an acceleration vector here and then the velocity uh, that I am traveling at is going to be my initial velocity uh, plus the integral from zero to t of the acceleration vector as a function of time times dt. So what this means is that I can actually just carry out an integral, which is the way of just reversing derivatives, and I carry out that integral and I can get to the velocity vector. Uh, I have gone ahead and invoked that our time is starting at t equals zero. If it doesn't, then the zero here and the velocity need to refer to the same time. Right now it's just t equals zero. Then I'm also going to get a big benefit because it's originally at rest. So that means at t equals zero, v equals zero. That seems so important, I'm gonna write it down. t equals zero, v naught equals zero. So that means I don't have to worry about that. I love it, it's fantastic. Not worrying is the thing I do best. Okay, so then we carry out the integral. So this is the integral from zero to t of, now I'm going to stick in my actual expression, a t i hat plus b t squared k hat. And I'm going to integrate that uh, with respect to dt. And this just means carry out that integral on the two separate parts. So it's zero to t of a times t dt, and this will be in the i hat direction, I hat's a constant, and one of the things you could do with integrals is you can pull constants out front of them. I could pull the a out as well, uh, plus uh, k hat times, I'll do that with the b here because I'm feeling wild, 0 to t, t squared dt, and I carry out these two integrals. Uh, so this is uh, t to the first, integrals add powers, uh, so this becomes uh, a t squared over 2, uh, and I have to evaluate that at 0 to t uh, times i hat, 
plus similar thing over here. So this becomes b t cubed over 3 k hat, and that's integrated from 0 to t. So this becomes a t squared over 2 minus 0 i hat plus b t cubed over 3 uh, minus 0 k hat. And so that means I know what my velocity vector is. My velocity vector is going to be a t squared over 2 i hat plus b t cubed over 3 k hat. You could probably have stopped here and sort of seen what the results are, and that's just something you're getting away with because the integral is starting at 0 and there's no constant terms or anything. Okay. So to get to the position, oops, we are still here. The position is the initial position, which is specified, it's not zero this time, plus the integral from zero to t of velocity vector of v dt. It's a very similar process. We just cal calculate this on a component by component basis. I'm not gonna stick in the velocity vector yet. I'm going by, or sorry, the initial position vector yet, but I'll do the integral of 0 to t of a t squared over 2 i hat plus b t cubed over 3 uh, j hat. And that'll be all integrated with respect to dt. That means carry out the individual parts separately. Uh, so then that's plus, uh, let's see here, this is i hat integral 0 to t of a t squared over 2 dt plus j hat integral 0 to t times b t cubed over 3 dt. And so from there, what I'll do is I'll just carry out those integrals, and I will get uh, that this is r naught plus, um, that's uh, skipping a little bit of the math here, this will be a t cubed uh, we pull a 3, uh, um, it puts a 3 in the denominator, which multiplies by the 2, that gives me a 6. Uh, I hat plus um, the bt cubed term is going to become a t to the fourth, stick a 4 in the denominator, and so that's become bt to the fourth over 4 times 3 is a 12 j hat. Okay, and then I plug in my numbers. And so r naught is equal to 3 i hat plus 2 j hat plus 5 k hat. I just got that out of a problem up here. Uh, and then my uh, expression, I'm going to stick in for t equals 2. Uh, so plus a, I can go and figure out what a is. That's 6 meters per second cube. Oh, sorry, this whole position is times meters. Let me uh, squeeze that in there so I keep my terms to have the same dimension. Meters plus 6 meters per second cubed times time cubed, which is 2 seconds cubed, quantity cubed, all over 6. Well, that's going to give me some nice cancellation. I love it when a term comes together. Uh, oops, I have switched to k hats, uh, from j hats to k hats. Sorry. Uh, let me amend this. This is, that's a k hat. Oh, that's a k hat. And oh, that's a k hat. Get out of here, y direction. You don't belong. And the reason I care about that is that I actually have to be careful when I'm actually adding these together. Okay, so let's see here. Uh, b t to the fourth over 12. So b is a half meters per second to the fourth times t to the fourth, which is two to the two uh, seconds to the fourth power, all divided by 12, uh, and that's k. Okay, and so uh, when we do that, we get that this is going to be, um, 6 times 6 times, uh, 6 divided by 6 times 2 cubed, uh, that's going to all go to 8 meters. Uh, 2 seconds to the fourth is 16, divided by 2 is 8, uh, divided by 12, that becomes 2 thirds of a meter, k hat. 
and this is uh, I hat. Uh, and then I add that to my initial position and I end up with three I hat plus another eight meters in the I hat direction. That becomes 11 I hat. Nothing in J, and that's why I freaked out when I had stuck in a bunch of J's uh, in the, the vectors, is that we actually have our acceleration here is only in the K direction, and so I actually care about only the K's. Uh, the J remains unchanged. Uh, there's no velocity, no acceleration, so that becomes 2J. And then I get my K term, which is the initial term, which is 5, plus the two thirds, which I carried out from all of the integrating here. And so that becomes, uh, let's see here, 15 thirds plus two thirds is going to be a whopping 17 thirds K hat. And this is all in terms of meters. Okay, so we've got ourselves our um, expression for where the particle is at T equals two seconds, just by integrating things out. Uh, let's start out by asking, what's the uh, velocity vector here? Well, this is a particle that's being moved along this little curve, uh, and then it sort of uh, follows parabolic motion. This is like a stop time photograph where each of these uh, uh, pictures of the ball is taken at a instant that is separated from the previous instant by a fixed time interval. So the time between each of the dots is the same. And so it lands down here, down 1.4 meters and over 2.0 meters from where it launches. Whenever you're doing projectile motion problems, first thing I always like to do is set up an origin to my coordinate system. I'm gonna pick right here at the bottom uh, for the coordinate system, I'm going to pick a sane one, which is that the x direction goes horizontally, the y direction goes uh, vertically, and then I can just write down the kinematic equations uh, that I know. I know that the velocity here is designed to be launched flat, so the velocity vector is some x component of the velocity in the i hat. It has no vertical uh, components, so there is no j component to it. Uh, the velocity over that's initial, uh, that's the initial velocity. Uh, the velocity over time uh, in the x direction is just going to be that same speed, v0x. The velocity in the y, component in the y direction is uh, starting out with zero because it's not going up or down, but because it's projectile motion, its speed is going down at minus gt. Not gonna be super helpful. Uh, what I do know is that the position's there. So my position uh, is going to be my initial position, which I have chosen here to be zero in the x direction, uh, plus v0x times t. Uh, so just for clarity, that's defined to be zero. In general, I leave everything as variables except for zeros, which I drop the terms out of the equation. Okay, returning uh, here, and we do y is equal to y naught uh, plus v zero y t. Uh, that's another thing that has gone to zero. And then uh, minus one half g t squared. Uh, y naught is uh, given in the problem. That's the 1.4 meters. That's the initial vertical displacement. And then the final is where it lands on the ground. Uh, and by choice, that's zero. Okay, I have a system of equations I can solve at this point. Uh, so I'll start out by asking what I'm after, which is the V naught X here. Uh, that's the thing I want. The thing I don't know in this equation is t, so I'm going to use the other equation over here to solve for t. Uh, so writing out what we actually have, so that zero is equal to y naught minus, oh, I'm in the wrong color. So zero is equal to y naught minus one half g t squared, that middle term has dropped out. I solve it, I'll push the half g t squared to the other side, so y naught is equal to one half g t squared, solve for t, so t is 2 y naught over g uh, raised to the 1 half power. Then I will stick that back in to this other equation here, 
and uh, solve for uh, v naught x. So v naught x is equal to x over t is equal to x over the square or times the square root of g over 2y naught. I've inverted my original expression to get to this one. And then I can actually just plug in numbers. So x is the 1.4, uh, x is 2.0 meters, 2.0 meters, times the square root of 9.81 meters per second squared over 2 times y naught, which is 1.4 meters. And that whole thing will uh, grind itself away to become 3.7 meters per second. So the velocity vector initial is 3.7 meters per second in the i hat direction. And we're where we want to be. OK. Basics of projectile motion. Just to recap what happened here, I uh, started out by setting up a coordinate system and choosing some directions. We wrote down the relevant projectile motion formulas. Um, uh, and then we use them as a system to solve and find the variable that we want. Okay, uh, if I, I can do similar uh, process here, ask if I set uh, over here my um, projectile, uh, I'm going to, let's see here, uh, let's uh, clear all of this in my lab. I'm going to go down to zero. I'm going to set my angle to 40 degrees and I'm going to crank my speed to 30 meters per second, and I'm going to fire this. And my piano leaves the stadium. But the question that I'd like to answer is, how long did the projectile, the piano in this case, stay airborne? Well, again, we have a, uh, we do the same process as before. Uh, we set up a coordinate system with a piano's trajectory trajectory in it. Uh, X and Y coordinates. I'm going to pick my origin to be where I launched from. I have an angle here, which is the 40 degrees. And then I uh, am going to go ahead and solve this again uh, using a uh, the position uh, formulas. The only one I really need to worry about is the y formula. So y is equal to y naught plus v naught sine alpha naught times t minus one half g t squared. And the only reason I have to worry about that is I only care about time. And in this equation, I know everything but time. I know that the final and the initial uh, altitudes or the heights are zero. And so therefore, I also know what V naught, sine alpha, and G are. So I can go ahead and solve that. So this becomes, there we are. Uh, so we know that zero is equal to V naught sine alpha naught T minus one half G T squared is equal to T times V naught sine alpha naught minus one half G T. And so this is a product of two numbers that's zero. Therefore, uh, one or both of them has to be zero. So there's two solutions, either t equals zero or t uh, is equal to, or, or sorry, uh, let's just do this as one half minus one half gt is minus v naught sine alpha naught. It's not the cleverest algebra, but that's okay. Uh, so we get 2 v naught sine alpha naught over g. So the t equals 0, this initial one up here, that's where it launches from. So that's this point. And then the v naught sine alpha over g is uh, where it lands over here. Uh, then I can plug in my numbers, which was uh, the hopes. So we get 2 times 30 meters per second. Uh, times sine alpha, sine of 40 degrees, all over 9.81 meters per second squared. Uh, I work all that out, and I get 3.93 seconds. And if I head on back over here, I can uh, zoom out, and I have my little time and range finder here, and put it where the piano is splatted, and sure enough, I get 3.93 seconds for the amount of time it took for that piano to go over the top.
All right, the last thing I'd like to do in projectile motion is to try to answer a question like that. So this refers to uh, this lab setup. I'd like to know how to hit this target here at 15 meters. If I have a cannon that is set up at five meters and an angle of 60, I'd like to know what I'm gonna set my initial speed here so that I actually hit the target. And that's not it. So let's uh, go and do a little physics here. Um, so switching back, uh, I'm going to set up uh, a little, uh, my, my setup is that I have a uh, projectile motion problem, launches at 60 degrees above the horizontal, comes over here and splats. I know that that's 5 meters. I know that that's 15 meters at some unknown speed, v naught. And then this uh, angle is 60 degrees. And that's everything I need to know. Okay. Uh, I'm going to pick my origin to be there. I'm going to pick my same coordinate systems uh, where up is in the y direction. And then what I'm going to do is uh, write out the uh, expressions I know. So in terms of the uh, horizontal position, I know that we're going to end at 15 meters. We're going to start, and then that's v naught cos alpha naught times t. Uh, so that'll give me my expression to figure out how far it's going. By choice of coordinate system, x naught is equal to zero. That's zero. Okay, uh, similar expression for y. So y is equal to y naught plus v naught sine alpha naught t minus one half g t squared. Uh, by choice, my y where I finish is going to be zero, and then I have the other things. So we're gonna adopt the strategy where we don't know how long it will take, and we don't know what the speed v naught is. So I'm going to use the first equation here to solve for t and substitute that into the second. And in doing so, I get that this is x over v naught cos alpha naught uh, is equal to t. I'm going to plug that into this equation up here. And so we get that 0 is equal to y naught plus v naught sine alpha naught times t, which is x over v naught cos alpha naught. And then we get minus 1 half g times x over v naught cos alpha naught quantity squared. Okay. And from uh, that expression, we actually have some nice math that works out here in that the v-naughts are going to cancel here. And then sine over the cosine is just going to become tangent. And so then we get that this is y-naught plus x tangent alpha-naught minus one-half g x v-naught cos alpha-naught quantity squared. Ooh, all right. So, so far so good. And then what we can do from here is solve for the v naught. And I'll do that by pushing this expression to the other side of the equation, uh, adding it to both sides. And so we will end up with um, one half g times x over v naught uh, cos alpha naught squared is equal to y plus x tan alpha naught. And then I'm going to solve for v naught by multiplying both sides by v naught squared and dividing both sides by the y plus x tan alpha naught uh, expression. And if I do that, I get that v naught squared is equal to um, x squared uh, g over 2 cos squared alpha naught uh, time, oops, sorry, uh, two plus, uh, or divided by y plus x tan alpha naught. And so this, uh, let me tidy it up. That's supposed to be a v naught squared. And so the v naught is just of a square root of that. So v naught is equal to the square root of gx squared over 2 cos squared alpha naught y plus x tan alpha naught 
raised to the one half power. And then it's all over, but subbing in some values. So let's do that. All right, we get 9.81 meters per second squared, because it's G. X is how far it travels. That's the 15 meters quantity squared. We divide that by 2 times the cosine of 60 degrees. Cosine 60, it's something I know. That's a half, so squared is a quarter. And then uh, Y is the 5 meters plus the... Um, uh, let's see here, the uh, x is the 15 meters times the tangent of 60 degrees. Oh, I, I actually know the tangent of 60 degrees too. It's uh, sine over cos, sine is root 3 over 2, cos is a half, so it's root 3. So that's root 3, cool. Take the square root and plug that into my calculator, do do do, and that's 1.93 1, 1 meters per second. Uh, or, if we were cared about significant figures, you would say that's either 2 or possibly 1, depending on how to treat that uh, as a decimal place or period. Uh, so, two significant figures would be 12 meters per second, which we can check. Let's try 12. And it's a hit. So, physics work. Or, yeah, this physics was the same as the physics that's in the computer here. 